Did you ever want to play a game and the server was down? Did you ever want to play with friends but didn't want to bother setting up or renting a server? Those things happen to me, but they won't happen in Cubus. Today I'll show you how I solve those problems. About a year ago I was starting to prepare for multiplayer. During that time I was also thinking about these problems. And I actually already stumbled over the solution. It's called hole punching and allows you to connect two computers through the internet directly. However, based on the Wikipedia article, a public server is required to initiate the connection. I didn't really want to set up a public server for Cubus, not even an authentication server. A central server like this is always a potential point of failure and a potential target for denial of service attacks. And also, if I ever stop supporting Cubus, which won't happen soon, don't worry, no one would be able to play if they need to connect to the public server. So I decided to go the route that many other games are going. In order to play with someone else, you have to configure port forwarding in your router and open up a server on your machine or pay for a public server. Luckily, I got diverted by terrain generation and tool crafting. Check out my last videos for that. In April, I was talking to a friend about multiplayer and he brought up UDP hole punching and he told me that it can be done without a server. I had to test that, so I made a little chat program with another friend that uses UDP hole pun punching. And it just worked. All we had to do was exchange our IP addresses. Okay, but how does hole punching actually work? And why is it needed? Nowadays many devices are connected through a single IP address using a router. Additionally to combining traffic from many devices onto a single IP address, the router also tries to protect you from unwanted outside traffic. Let's look at what happens when you load a website. When the packet passes the router, it stores who made the request to that server so it can later return the packet to the correct computer. The router also changes the source IP address of the packet to its IP address and gives it a unique port. When the resulting packet containing the web page returns, the router checks who made the request and forwards it to that computer. So in essence, we can only receive a packet if we previously sent a packet to that IP address. So in order to establish a connection between two players that are both behind a router, they have to send packets at each other at roughly the same time. This is the concept of hole punch. In Cubus I decided to work with UDP hole punching because I didn't want to mess with the TCP handshake. Normally in hole punching an additional server is used to exchange the IP addresses. But as I already said I don't want to host a public server so I decided to rely on the players to exchange the IP addresses. Getting the IP address in public port is another problem. Sadly, there is no easy way to determine these from the inside, instead I have to ask a public server. Luckily for us, there are other services that rely on UDP hole punching, such as voice over IP. They have set up a bunch of servers that just check your IP address and port and send them back to you using the stun protocol. So I just make a request to a random stun server and give the result to the player. That seems to work. Let's test it on some different routers. I could for example try it on a mobile hotspot. Well, my mobile hotspot uses something called symmetric network address translation. That means that for every destination it gives me a new random port. So when I connect to the Cubus server, it gives me a different port to the one that I got from the stun server and I can't connect. Sadly, there is no reliable way to determine the public port from symmetric network address translation. 
Other services just use an intermediary public server that relays the data in this case. But again, I don't want to set up a public server, so let's try something different. There's only 65,000 different ports, so in theory it should be possible to just brute force them all. Sadly, I can't do much more than 100 ports a second, otherwise the IP address gets reset. In the worst case, that could be up to 11 minutes of waiting time, but luckily most routers are predictable and choose similar ports. So if we know the stun port, then we can start searching there and should find the correct port in less time. It's not optimal, but it's the best I could get, and it should work unless both server and client are behind symmetric network address translation. And on most home networks, this isn't a problem at all. I tested it with five different people and it always worked without a problem. Alright, now that everyone is connected, we can talk about the actual protocol. Because I chose UDP, there are some additional problems. Unlike TCP, UDP doesn't ensure that all the packets are received in the right order. And they might even get lost along the way. So I basically need to reinvent the wheel and effectively add my own version of TCP on top of UDP. It's relatively easy actually. In essence, each packet has a unique ID and whenever a packet is received, I sent a confirmation back to the sender. If the sender didn't receive a confirmation in time, it sends the packet again. Since this is my own system, I actually have an advantage over TCP. I can decide what packets need to arrive in the right order and what packets are not as important but should receive lower latency. The entity position packets for example should arrive as fast as possible and it doesn't really make a difference whether the packet is lost or is received too late or in the wrong order. Since you don't need to play on a public server, and I assume that you play with your friends, you can skip all the cheating and griefing protection. After all, if your friends grief you, then you definitely chose the wrong friends. And because of the UDP hole punching, you have to invite every player manually, which also prevents random people from joining. There's a great video from Live Overflow about how one could find and join seemingly private Minecraft servers. No cheating protection also means there is no authentication required, no validation required and my life as a developer is easy. But also for players this means that the experience can be more smooth. No lagbacks, no random gigs from cheat detection and no controversial chat reporting or unwanted account migrations. Despite that simplification, there are still a few challenges left. First of all, I somehow need to display the position of other players. Obviously, network connection is not instant, so I have to either predict the future position or show the player a past position. I decided to show the past position because it's generally easier to do, and more consistent. If I try to predict the future and I'm not careful, I might end up with wild movement that doesn't resemble how the player actually moved. The second challenge is that I don't get data every frame, but more like every 10 frames. As you can see, that feels quite laggy. So I have to interpolate the position between the data points I get. For that, I decided to simply use the cubic spline because it creates smooth looking movement. The interpolation also means that in order to avoid inconsistencies, I have to go back further into the past, so I already have the next data point when I need to calculate the interpolation. Now, as already mentioned, UDP isn't safe, and I might have to deal with missing data. In that case, I decided to simply let entities move at the current speed, and when I get a new data point, I start interpolating from the last prediction. 
What's interesting about this approach is that there will be no teleportation when the position is off. Instead, it smoothly moves there using the most direct route. Alright, that's it. There's still some rough edges though. Apart from the obviously missing player model, there is also the user interface which is still inconsistent and weird, and there is some bugs like the dancing item drops. I work on the player model once I have entity animation support, and I'll keep pushing UI improvements into the distant future. I also made a couple of performance improvements and terrain generation is now super fast. You might even say it's so fast that the game started lagging. But more about that in my next video. If you want to test multiplayer yourself, you can check the links in the description.